Welcome to the NTEB Prophecy News Podcast with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good afternoon, happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Prophecy News Podcast today. Corporate retail giants like Target are doubling down on support for turning your children into transgenders. The pride section at Target, routinely placed toward the front of the department stores, features items for not just adults but children as well. And this year, Target is rolling out a, quote, tuck-friendly, end quote, bathing suit designed to help biological men tuck their genitals away to appear more feminine. One bathing suit created in partnership with Humankind states that it is designed for comfort and confidence and created with a tuck-friendly construction. Chest binders, tuck-friendly bathing suits for kids. What in the literal hell is happening? Oh, that's right. It's the days of Lot. Luke 17, 28 and 29 says... Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. On this episode of the Prophecy News Podcast, Corporate America is doubling down and tripling down on their support, not only for the LGBTQIA plus movement in general, but for transgender children in particular. Support to groom, recruit, and transition children is across the corporate spectrum with industry giants like Target and media giants like Disney leading the charge. But they're far from the only ones who are doing it. The evangelical church is doing it as well, led by heretics like Andy Stanley at the massive uh, quarter-million-strong North Point Community Church mega-complex. I'm all for a good boycott, but honestly, at this point, I really can't see them doing much good. Sales of Bud Light have dropped 24%, and they don't seem to care. No amount of boycott will change the minds of groups like Target and Disney. On this episode of the Prophecy News Podcast, we show you just how far the days of Lot and how fast the days of Lot are pulling into the gate. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, God, for waking us up today, for putting food on the table, clothes on our back, and a roof over our head. We're glad and grateful to be saved and serving in whatever capacity you have called each and every one of us to serve on. And uh, Lord, this is camp meeting weekend, and we're so excited. And uh, Lord, please uh, watch over everyone who is traveling here, everyone who's going to be preaching and teaching and serving and ministering, and everybody who will be listening either uh, live or in the video streams on every level, Lord. And for the people who can't make it, uh, Father God, uh, we just pray a special blessing for them and that they would be praying for us and for the people who are still on their way. um, We pray, Lord, that you would give everybody traveling mercies coming to and fro. Today, we pray for salvation. Joe Rusiello, he says, uh, please pray for my mom, my sister, granddaughter, and in-laws. Ellen says, please pray for my grandkids, Braden and Logan. His Grace says, uh, please pray for Rob Summer, Sue and Mike, Carl Jason, Rachel, Jason and Carrie. Lola's son, William, and his wife, Lindsay, they need to get saved. Hannah's mom, she needs to get saved. Uh, Anja is praying for Hanu, John, Charles, and Anna Lilsa. Dave Evans, water dog in the chat room, is asking salvation prayer for his friend Taylor, who is an atheist. Viviana is praying for her brother Javier Reyes. Adam and Katie are praying for their neighbors, Jason, Eddie, and Brian. Loretta Oates is praying for her sons, Kenny and Matthew. Uh, The people who need a healing, my friend Annetta, she had a stroke almost exactly a year ago. And um, it was pretty bad, but she is getting better every day. 
She still doesn't have full mobility on her left hand side, and we are not going to stop praying until the Lord heals her completely. So please remember Anetta in your prayers. Robert Wiley is battling ALS disease. Rob Beatty. Honestly, I have no idea what God is doing with Rob Beatty. Stage four colon cancer, emergency surgery, put into a hospice, told by doctors and nurses to pack his bags. He's going home to heaven and we we're praying for him on every broadcast and all of a sudden he's off the medicine he's out of the hospice and uh he's going back to barbecuing in his backyard um no he's not faking stage four colon cancer god is doing something in his life and i don't know what it is but i'm glad to see it so please keep praying for rob Beatty. clayton perry he's battling the side effects of chemotherapy Aaron Riddle's sister, Tracy, has metastatic breast cancer. Shira Shine, uh, please pray for my kids, Nicole, Sherry, and Scott. Maddie Luck, uh, she is dealing with Luli body dementia. And uh, she says, I have physical problems, but it's all in his hands. Please keep me in your prayers. I am in rapture mode. Amen. Jill Puckett says she needs prayer because she's losing her vision. Rebecca Lynn is praying for Joel Smith to get saved. Linda, praying for Hannah's mom, who got blood clots. Uh, Prayers for her healing and for her salvation. Natalie and Ken, were praying for health issues. Patricia Alliston, Alliston, would like prayers for her husband, Ron, who has cancer. Sharon Hansen needs prayer for healing. She has periods of confusion. And um, uh, she just needs the Lord to do something. Gary is asking prayer for his friend Carrick from Pennsylvania with MS. Jeanette says, um, praise God, good news. Uh, My mom's diagnostic mammogram was done Wednesday and no cancer. And she puts about a thousand exclamation points and rightly so. And uh, we rejoice with her on that great praise report. Dina Kruger is asking us to pray for Katrina, who had brain surgery, for uh, her son Jordan Shapiro's salvation, and for her mom, Marcy, uh, who's uh, undergoing radiation for colon cancer. Patty Rogalski and her husband, Jerry, ongoing health issues, please pray. Cindy Kettlecamp, she called me about a half hour ago. They are on their way uh, from, from Tampa, as is Joel Tillis and his team. And um, she says, uh, please keep praying for our daughter, Brooke, and looking forward to camp meeting weekend. Angel, my mom, Rosemary, was saved in March, and um, she got blood clots after getting the vaccine. She's in hospice. Please keep her in your prayers. My friend and very talented photographer, Krista Ray, battling a, a, a tumor in her chest that is wrapped around five of her ribs. Uh, Dan Kane, please pray for my wife, Roxy, with MS and my son, Jordan. Kate's sister, Darlene, has liver failure and needs prayer. Uh, Catherine B., uh, pray for my son, pressure at work. His name is Thomas. Mona, um, she has a longtime friend who needs to get on the lung transplant list. Um, uh, Trisha says, Amanda and Mike are fighting some serious spiritual battles, and please pray for them. Natalie, uh, please pray for my nephew, Nick. Um, Sharon Deganius is continuing to recover, albeit slowly. Annetta, um, please, no, not Annetta, Annette. Please pray for my left knee. I have a torn meniscus. Bobby Matthias is asking prayer for his mom. She's dealt with a number of health issues over the years. Um, Kyle's uncle, David, the chemotherapy is not working. And uh, please pray for the doctors to have wisdom on alternative treatment options. Um, Dara says, my dog Bella has a tumor and will be having surgery. Please pray. Derek O'Reilly, my grandmother Rose is 98 and currently not well and just wants to go home to be with the Lord. Please pray for her. Kelly Holloway. She was in a, she was on her way um, to come here. Well, not on her way literally but a couple of days ago she her and her husband were planning to come to the camp meeting she was involved in a bad car accident 
And she texts me this morning and said that she'll be going uh, undergoing surgery at 10 o'clock, which was two hours ago. I posted that to Facebook, but please pray for Kelly Holloway to recover um, and to get through the surgery. A uh, prayer request for Chuck, who needs to go on dialysis. Um, Peggy Caulfield, um, please continue to pray for my mom, Dorcas Foreman, to recover uh, from surgery. And um, for Paul Caulfield, who has type 1 sugar diabetes. Ladies who are expecting Elena Blackburn, Kelsey Emerson, Aaron Riddle, Gary Tatterson's daughter, Kayla, Linda and Joe's son and daughter-in-law, uh, April's niece, Shelby. Um, she's not due till September, but her contractions are not stopping. So the Lord just needs to get in there and do something with that. Uh, Terry Bryant's daughter, Jillian, is expecting. Uh, Heather's daughter is pregnant, but not saved. And Shira Shine's daughter-in-law is expecting and due in December. <coughs> So please pray for all the expectant ladies, the babies, the dads, doctors, and nurses. Mark Saxa, please pray for my son Joseph to return to the Lord as um, please pray for my son Calvin. Aunt Nancy, uh, please pray for Brandon and Michelle to get saved. Leslie needs the Lord to get involved in an urgent financial situation. Joni would like salvation prayers for Ashley, Clint, Ember, Knox, Lucas, Brian, Mary, and Dee. Um, Sadie, uh, she's coming to the camp meeting and wants prayer for the Lord to lead and guide. Uh, Jill Hall, uh, please pray for Carly to get saved. She is a mother of three boys who is getting off drugs. And I gave her a Bible and told her to begin reading and that Jesus loves her. Amen. Bruce Bridges, urgent prayer request for Elena and Melena. They're going home uh, in two weeks. They have been uh, exchange students in the Bridges home for the last year. They have heard the gospel. They have rejected the gospel. Please pray that they get saved. Uh, Jeanette says, I still need a weekend caregiver. The La Piana family, Jeanette, Marie C., Adrian P. Brita, Chris Hart, <coughs> Kate, <clears throat> excuse me, John Bayor, Haley and Dan, Dr. Shirley, Jericho, Henry Biggs, Debbie, Dana Bragdon, and myself. We all have unspoken prayer requests. Please keep <clears throat> Mike Hensel in your prayers as he continues to seek the Lord's guidance and medical guidance regarding his knee. And please keep Trisha in your prayer as she does the same, seeking the Lord's guidance and medical guidance regarding her hip. And Gail Comfort as well. Gail, who works at the bookstore, um, is scheduled for uh, hip replacement surgery, as is my, my friend Ethan. Um, lots of people having hip and knee replacement surgeries. Jericho Daly says, praying for my throat and my lungs. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know what the Bible says in second Corinthians chapter two, verse seven, Paul says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. I have besought the Lord a whole lot more than three times to get rid of this cough. But verse 9 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities and persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and the, long, it, it, the list is long and grows longer every time we have a broadcast. And all these people need to hear from you, Lord. Uh, and each and every one of these prayer requests, large and small, 
Uh, they're important to the person who's asking the prayer. Everything from the stage four colon cancer all the way down to the dog having surgery and everything in between. All these prayers are the prayers of your children, Lord, of your people. And many of these prayers are prayers of your children for those who are not your children, but um, they need to be. And so, Father God, as we um, start the camp meeting weekend, we just pray, Lord, that um, you would hear every one of these prayer requests, both spoken and unspoken, that you would um, answer the need of every heart today. Your word says in Proverbs chapter 3 um, that we are not to lean into our own understanding, but to acknowledge you in, in all of our ways and that you'll direct our paths. And um, Father God, we just ask for that today for everybody who is hurting today. We ask, Lord, that you comfort everybody who needs a healing today. We ask you, Lord, as, as the great physician to work and move everybody who needs comfort and reassurance and assurance and all the lost souls that need to get saved. Lord, please step into that situation and do something. And for the camp meeting weekend, Lord, we, we earnestly covet um, your blessing that you would guide over every aspect, every minute of everything, that every uh, morsel of food that is consumed, every word that is spoken, everything that is heard and everything that is done. And uh, Lord, we'll give you all the honor and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Um, we have a number of prayer requests from the chat room. Mitch says, um, thank everybody who, who prayed for my son's sister-in-law, Sarah. She is now completely healed and home with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Teresa, please pray for my son-in-law and oldest grandson driving to help me move to be with them 12 hours plus, And for my daughter who has MS and a virus that has caused shingles. Um, Bruce Bridges, please, please continue to pray for Elena and Milena. Um, Rob says, please pray for my friend Mike with MS. He is dealing with unfathomable issues, including medical help, living conditions and declining health. The good news is he has not given up hope and is back in the fight. Amen. And um, if you would like me to get on the phone with your friend, Mike, for prayer and a word of encouragement. Um, I'll be happy to do that, brother. Just let me know. Rapture 57 finally got some zinc yesterday. Triple dosed myself before bed and woke up feeling much better already. Amen. Rachel Elizabeth um, asking prayer for a job to open up for her. Paul Caulfield. Yeah, we are praying for your diabetes, brother. Uh, Lori Ann has a number of unspokens today. Um, she's the manager of the bookstore and, um, it's going to be a very overwhelming day, uh, at the bookstore and the camp meeting, but in a good way. So please keep Lori Ann and Haley and the other Haley and, uh, Gail and, um, just everybody who's going to be working at the bookstore today. Angel, happy Friday, everybody need prayer going through a lot with my mom having many strokes and she's ready to go home to the Lord soon. Amen. Uh, please pray for Angel's mom. Catherine B., she listens to these programs on dialysis. You know, one of the things that, um, that I appreciate most about this prayer list is every time that I think I'm having a bad day, every time that I think that I'm overwhelmed with whatever it is, and I think of people like Catherine B., um, who's on constant dialysis and has a whole host of other medical issues, and she lies on the dialysis table um, praising the Lord while she listens to this podcast. Uh, people like Annetta, um, she got saved shortly um, after her stroke, and um, she is trusting in the Lord to heal her. She still can't move her left side, and, uh, you know, 
Our time here is short. It really, really, really is. And uh, we need to keep lifting each other up in prayer, uh, to be praying for ourselves. You know, uh, a lot of the times Christians will say to me, oh, no, don't pray for me, brother. I don't, I don't want to be selfish. Uh, that's one thing that you should be selfish about. You should pray for yourself. Uh, Lord, um, thank you for the food. Thank you for waking me up. Lord, um, keep me on the straight and narrow path. Father God, uh, forgive me where I go wrong. And whatever the case may be, and keep short accounts with the Lord. You should be bringing yourself up before the Lord constantly, but you should also be bringing up others before the Lord as well. Um, prayer is the greatest power that we have after salvation. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we commit this time to you, and ask you to work and move in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, well, welcome, everybody. Glad that you're here today. Uh, welcome to everybody in the studio. It's good to see all these friendly, smiling faces. And um, uh, I look forward to the day when maybe this podcast, this broadcast, um, we will have a dedicated studio that can have a live audience. I think that would be great. Um, but, you know, we'll just leave that in the Lord's hands. Uh, today I want to talk, uh, turn, turn to Luke 17. I want to talk about something today and, um, uh, at six o'clock today at the bookstore, we're going to have a live soul trap, um, broadcast with pastor Joel Tillis from Suncoast Baptist church. And it's going to be a, a, a panel. It's going to be myself and Dr. Bill Grady, pastor Dave Struble from solid rock Baptist church in Sparta, New Jersey. And um, Pastor Joel Tillis is going to be the moderator, but he's not getting off that easy. He's going to have to answer his own questions. Um, but one of the things that we're going to talk about today, and for those of you that can't make it, this the entire podcast will be live streamed on the Soul Trap YouTube channel. And I did an article yesterday about uh, the camp meeting, and in the bottom of that article is the link for the live podcast of the soul trap. Um, and I hope all you guys will be watching that. But one of the things in Luke chapter 17, and this is the companion passage to Matthew chapter 24. And <clears throat> take a listen to what Jesus says. And we're just going to read a little bit of a, like, I don't know, eight verses. We're going to do Luke seventeen twenty two through 30. And he said unto his disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus is called the Son of Man. That's when he's dealing with the Jewish people regarding the kingdom of heaven. And then he's called the Son of God. That's when he's dealing with the born-again people who are the body of Christ. And um, this is one of the many, many ways that we know that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two separate kingdoms. Now, when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see very, very obviously that Jesus talks almost interchangeably about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The reason for that is that Jesus Christ is the king of both those kingdoms. And wherever he is, both those kingdoms are present. And um, something happened in, uh, keep your finger in Luke 17, and um, I think it's Matthew 21, Matthew 21, where he says that the, that the, that the kingdom of God is taken from you um, and given to a nation who is going to bear the fruits of that. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Um, where is that verse? Yeah, here it is. Matthew twenty one forty three. Jesus says, talking to the Jewish people, well, actually 42. Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures 
the stone which the builders rejected. The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Now, what is one of the consequences of the Jewish people rejecting that chief cornerstone, which is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ? Well, verse 43 of Matthew 21 tells you the price that the Jewish people have to pay. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And of course, at the end of Acts chapter 7, we see the closing of the, of the uh, kingdom of heaven um, and the opening of the time of the kingdom of God, which is the spiritual kingdom. Uh, so back in Luke chapter 17, Jesus says that you'll desire to see uh, one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say unto you, See here or see there. Go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first... Must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation? And then he skips 2,000 years into the future. Verse 26 says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Revelation 19. So, what are we talking about today? Well, I said all that to say this. We're talking about tuck-friendly bathing suits. Tuck-friendly bathing suits. Have you ever heard of that? Well, you're going to... I only heard about it this morning, and you're going to find out about it right now. Here at Target, because I heard that their new Pride collection was out, so let's take a look. This is a special swimsuit. It is invented for tucking. Live, laugh, lesbian. Are they amoebas? These don't even look like people. Queer, queer. This right here. These are baby clothes. They say that grooming isn't happening. Then why are there pride baby onesies? Trans people will always exist. This is the ugliest shirt I've ever seen. I don't care if you're queer. Why would you wear this? This is ugly. Kids go into a, a pride parade. You get a little pride skirt for your kid. Super queer. It's like a, it's like a superpower. Honestly, Target, what is going on? This is pretty disgusting. A whole collection for pride. The tucking bathing suit, though. Th this is something new. I have yet to see a bathing suit that is for tucking. I'm sorry I chose you again. I just needed to do the bathing suit the last bit. I found the tuck bathing suits, the tuck-friendly bathing suits. So if you need a women's bathing suit and you have a little extra meat down there that you got to hide, you have one option. That is the only bathing suit that I found in the entire... All right, let me just stop that right there. That woman just, she, if you were to watch that video, you would see that the woman was in Target and she was holding up the tuck-friendly bathing suit and you just heard her say that this bathing suit is good if you have a little bit of extra meat that you need to hide when you go swimming. What is she talking about? Well, She's talking about men who have penises who want to dress up like a woman and they want to wear a bathing suit and they want to make you think that they're a woman, but they don't want to have their penis removed. So to accommodate this, they are now and target. Do you enjoy shopping at Target? Do you enjoy supporting uh, what ta what Target stands for. Um, I know the popcorn is great. 
It comes in that long white bag. And I know that they have Starbucks in front of, you know, every single store. And I get the fact that the store is very neatly arranged and pleasant to look at. But you're supporting uh, transgender bathrooms. You're supporting the tuck bathing suits. And um, I don't even know if I want to play any more of this clip. I don't know. Fire store, and it's in the pride section. It's not in the kids section, women's section, boys section, baby section. It is in the pride section. It was the only one I could find. And I did have another adult with me checking all the tags so that I didn't have to stay in the store for nine hours. Look at how ridiculous this is. No, I think that's about all of that clip that I want to play. Um, and, you know, from time to time, people will email me and they'll say, hey, brother, you know, you got to stop talking about these things and don't talk about, you know, uh, transgender, anatomically correct body parts. Um, well, you know what? If the body of Christ doesn't talk about these things, who is going to talk about these things? You know what's happening What's happening right now uh, is something that we warned about 10 years ago. For over a decade, we have been publishing articles. And look, if you're gay, lesbian, transgender, we are absolutely not against you. We are for you as a human being. We are for you as a precious soul that exists in this world. You know who my best friend in the entire world was and honestly still is? My best friend in the entire world um, was my brother, Bob, and he died. um, Well, officially, he died of AIDS in 1988. Um, But what he actually died of was taking Anthony Fauci's AZT poison, which killed a quarter million gay people. And um, so I didn't just start hating Anthony Fauci uh, three years ago. I've had a chip on my shoulder against Anthony Fauci uh, for the the last uh, three plus decades. But that's a podcast for another day. The point of what I'm saying is, if you're a transgender, you have a friend here at Now the End Begins. Why? Because we love you. Because we want to see you get saved. Um... We want to see you broken out of that transgender ideology that has enslaved you, that has ensnared you. And the power of God is absolutely able to do that. Um, Have you ever heard of the woman Laura Perry? She wrote this great book called Transgender to Transformed. And you can go to BibleBeliever.com and you can pick yourself up a copy of that book. And I highly recommend that you read it. But Laura Perry reached out to me a number of years ago. I had never heard of her before. I was um, Facebook friends with her mom. um, But I had never known anything about her daughter, Laura. And Laura reached out to me about three and a half years ago. And she said to me, You don't know me, but my mom started listening to your Bible studies, and um, I got involved with the transgender movement. And when Laura Perry, if you've ever heard her testimony, when she says that she got involved with the transgender movement, she didn't have one foot in, one foot out. She wasn't like Bruce Jenner, um, who has breast implants, but that's as far as he went. She had her breast surgically removed. She had every part of her reproductive system ripped out on the operating table. She didn't approach transgenderism with any sort of halfway measure. But you know what happened to Laura Perry when her mom started listening to our Bible studies? Uh, And I only know this because this is what Laura told me. When her mom started listening to our Bible studies and then... Um, her mom started this prayer group with other women at the church. And then she finally got Laura to listen to a couple of our Bible studies. And Laura said to me, she said, when you started talking about the rapture and how much that you're looking forward to that and what the qualification is for the rapture, people write to me all the time. They, and they uh, say, how good do I have to be? To be taken up in the rapture. 
Well, it's not about being good. It's about being born again. It's about being saved. If you struggle with alcohol, and at the, but if you're born again, at the moment of the rapture, you might be at happy hour at the bar, but you're going to go up. And you're going to have to explain that at the judgment seat of Christ. But the only qualification for being taken up in the rapture is you've got to be born again. And long story short, Laura started really listening to our Bible studies. And the day came where the, the prayer group that her mom had for her and a combination of everything, we just played one small part in that. And the day came when Laura Perry, 100% in her male alter ego, she got on her knees and she got saved and she came up from that and she was released from the bondage of transgenderism. And today she has been restored to a beautiful young lady. She, She got married two years ago. And she travels the country with an open heart pleading with transgenders to get saved. And what a great example of uh, God's saving power. So, if you're transgender, I want you to know that we're not against you. We're for you. But we are not for the transgender movement. We are not for the ideology. Uh, Billy Sunday had a heart for alcoholics. He was an alcoholic. But he hated alcohol. And he was very, very outspoken in his hatred of alcohol. But his love for the alcoholic. And um, uh, so if you're listening today... If you're transgender, you know, you know that you've been deceived. You know that you've been sold a bill of goods. And um, we're praying for you. So Target, one of America's largest and most successful retailers, they're selling tuck-friendly bathing suits so that men can tuck their junk underneath and put on a wig and lipstick and padded bras. And if you've ever read the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, and you see when um, um, uh, Pilgrim gets to Vanity Fair, uh, we're living in it. We are absolutely living in Vanity Fair. And the things that we warned about 10 years ago, they're here now. They've come true. And um, sometimes people will accuse me of overly sensationalizing our headlines. Now, I'll agree with part of that statement. When we do an article, I like to think that the headlines are sensational. Uh, Not simply because I'm writing the article, but we live in sensational times. Remember when you first started reading the Bible And you would say to yourself, man, I wished I live in Bible times. Well, you do. You're living in the end times. You're living in the last days. Behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously, Habakkuk says, for I will work a work in your day which you will not believe, though it be told you. Now, before I get too far down the rabbit hole with Target... And no, I'm not calling for a boycott, just like I'm not calling for a boycott of Bud Light because I don't drink alcohol. I don't care, but I'm glad that other people are boycotting Bud Light. I'm glad that their sales are down 24%. I hope they go down um, 94%. I hope they go out of business. Um, I hate alcohol, but, but, um, Lest you think, and I can't boycott Target because I don't shop at Target. Um, If you remember about eight years ago when Target got into the LGBTQ pride business, um, there was a whole controversy with Target regarding um, transgender bathrooms. Remember that? 
and there was a huge boycott at the time, and it knocked $10 billion off of their market capitalization. And you think to yourself, wow, we just had a boycott. $10 billion they lost. Well, they didn't lose $10 billion from their bank account. They just lost market share in the stock market. And obviously, they've only gotten bigger since that, that day. Um, they are a very wealthy, very powerful country. Uh, company. Feels like they're a country. Um, but I can't boycott Target because I don't shop at Target. Um, I stopped shopping there during the boycott from years ago. And I've never gone back. And I have no plans for going back. But... If you want to start shopping someplace else, you know, that's probably a really good idea unless you're in favor of tuck-friendly bathing suits. Now, I don't want you to think that all of this stuff that we're talking about is exclusively coming from the Fortune 500 companies. I used to work for multiple Fortune 500 companies. Um, when you see me here at the studio and most of the times I'm wearing shorts and I have a ponytail and, um, t-shirt with the sleeves rolled up, I do not look like a corporate employee. Um, but there was a day when I was a creative director at Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, when I was a creative director at Brocco Diagnostics, a $3 billion Italian pharmaceutical company. And there was a day when I worked on the team at Citibank in a 100% corporate mode. So I understand a little bit about corporations. And I can remember back in 2012, 2013 at Citibank in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, And I worked on the team that supported the website. If you have a Citibank credit card, um, I worked on the website that supported that. And I... I can remember, if you've ever been to their headquarters, it's three large buildings, and in the middle building, it's kind of like the main building, in the middle building, there's this big, I don't know, 30-foot, 40-foot atrium, and I'll never forget watching them decorate it for Pride Month, and then seeing the emails that were coming across my corporate email, and... um. These corporations, they are not just supporting the LGBT movement. They are expanding it. They are funding it. They are funding it. I can remember one email that I got that was sent out to everybody. And the email said that if you were gay, lesbian, transsexual, whatever your initial was, if you wanted to publicly come out of the closet then you would be eligible for a raise and a promotion for being moved from a cubicle to an office. And all you had to do was be willing to put a sign on your office or a cubicle saying that you were part of the Citibank pride team. Now, I know that sounds like I'm making it up, but I'm not making it up. I had that email. Um, I lived through that. That was 10 years ago. It's gotten 10 times as bad, but I don't want you thinking that this is only a problem with corporate America. You know where it's happening just as much in the Pentecostal church, in the charismatic church, and in the lukewarm Laodicean evangelical church. Now you might say to me, no, no, not the Southern Baptist convention. Yep, Southern Baptist Convention. Take a listen to this clip. Her name is Rachel Gilson, and she is the co-pastor wife of Andy Wood, who was the replacement for Rick Warren at Saddleback Church. She recently spoke at a Southern Baptist Convention conference and Somebody asked her, what about gay people who are married and they get saved? What should happen to their marriage? Now, if you're a Bible believer and if it takes you longer than 
22, 23, 25 seconds tops to answer that question. If it takes you longer than 45 seconds to give me at least three Bible verses supporting your position, well, um, you might want to get back to your daily Bible study. But take a listen to what co-pastor at Saddleback Church, Rachel Gilson, had to say at a Southern Baptist Convention Speakers Conference. Um, I have gay married parents because gay marriage is legal in all 50 states now. So I guess my question is, where should I be in terms of my support of that marriage since it is the covenant of marriage? Should I be looking for, like, should I be supporting a divorce, even though God said he hates that as well? Or should I be looking for them to kind of, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. All right. So the man who's asking the uh, question, he's very honest. I think it's a great question. Um, If you've ever spent time in front of people speaking to groups of people, uh, or if you were on an interview show or a podcast or whatever the case may be, if you're a minister and somebody asks you a question like that, that's what we call a softball question, meaning, uh, and now I know I don't mean to offend any ladies who play women's softball. I used to have a teacher friend of mine, and she and she played on a, 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 a state champion softball team, and the back of her shirt said, at 70 miles an hour, there's nothing soft about it. So I get it. Um, women's softball is very competitive, and... Um, So no offense if you're on a woman's softball team, but this type of question is what they call a softball question from the perspective is that you as the minister should be able to instantly and easily answer this question with without any preparation. If you believe the Bible, well, Rachel Gilson, she had half of that right. She had an immediate answer. But take a listen to what her answer is. I think it's a, it's a great question, right? Like we know that the laws of our country don't um, match what God's laws say. That's fine. We don't live in ancient Israel. We don't live in the New Jerusalem. We live in America. So we respect the laws of the land. I'm right with her so far. We don't live in ancient Israel. Check one. We don't live in New Jerusalem. That's not until Revelation 21. Check two. Um, we respect the laws of the land. Check three. Paul says, in as much as is within you, live peaceably with all men. I get it. And then she said this. Um, as we think about, and especially like your parents, like you love your parents. I'm sure you see them all the, like, I mean, we also get annoyed with our parents, right? Let's be real, right? But you see them as full people, like you see, which is good. Like we should be seeing all the people in our life as full people. Um, so when we think about, <clears throat> I don't know your parents, I'm not going to speak too particularly into it, right? But as we think about the question of people in a same-sex marriage who maybe come to know the Lord, this is a real situation that I've encountered in my life. I, I met a woman recently in St. Louis who was actually in this, she was in, a mar- she was in a marriage to a woman and was processing what to do because she had come to the Lord, but her wife hadn't. We need to recognize in this situation, right, that um, these are some very tender things. And if we just walk around being like, I've got some great ideas, like, you don't know anything. You don't know anything about what this relationship has been like. All right, so uh, Rachel Gilson, she very quickly um, transitioned, pardon the pun, she very quickly transitioned over to, well, I personally know two women who were married and they got saved. And now, what about that marriage? Well, if you're a minister of the gospel, here's the answer. Romans one twenty two, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and to creeping things. 
Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart to dishonor their bodies, their own bodies between themselves. And look down in verse 26. For this cause, here's the context. God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Now, you don't have to beat somebody over the head with that. When I preach on the streets, I've never used a bullhorn. I've never used a megaphone. I've never jabbed my finger in somebody's face. I've never used the expression while street preaching, you wicked sinners, you miserable drunks. I've never said that and I never will say that. But that doesn't mean I compromise the gospel. You can say it nicely. You can say it with love toward the person that you're giving it to and not with barely disguised hatred. You know, I think street preachers would be a whole lot more successful if they showed love for the people that they were preaching to. Um, If you don't have love for the person that you're preaching to, um, I don't know what type of preaching that is. But again, that that's a podcast for another day. Um, Let's finish out this clip. The joys that it's provided, the heaviness is provided. Like we never approach these situations um, with swagger. So she just said about the lesbian marriage, the two women get saved. And now she said, well, what about the marriage with the, with the love that it's provided and the joy that it's provided? The Bible says that that marriage, that love, that joy is wicked, reprobate sin. Now, again, you can say that nicely, but you can't not say it. And this is why you will hear Andy Stanley get up in front of his 4,000-member North Point Church that has another nine satellite churches attached to it. So when he preaches on a Sunday, he's preaching to almost a quarter million people live. And he hates Romans 1. He hates it. And he says, yeah, I could give you all the verses, but then he never does. Because Andy Stanley is promoting And we're going to talk about that before the podcast is done. If someone is a trust, if we've got a relationship where they're trusting us to speak in and trusting us to draw near, we want to listen really carefully. I like with any person, discipleship is going to be a process. And so I'd say if someone in a same sex marriage comes to know the Lord, it's not like, okay, what we got to deal with first is your same sex marriage. Like our discipleship is our whole person. When we come to Christ, there are a lot of things that need attention, that need um, forgiveness, that need healing, that need adjusting. But I do hope that over the course of discipleship for someone in that position, they're going to have a chance to examine what the Bible says about sexuality, and they're going to have a trustworthy person to walk through with them what that means for their life. When you're a child, especially when you're in that weird stage where you're like, for the first time, an adult child relating to adult parents, that's weird, right? It's just weird. You used to be five and they were old and now you're like old but not as old. You just don't... If you're a parent relating to someone in that situation, you've already got that strange dynamic on top of something that is theologically and emotionally really heavy. So I would say as their son, you love them and help them in whatever way, right? You love them... as you try to follow the Lord, as they try to follow the Lord, to come around the scriptures together and figure out what's going on. I do think that it's, it's pretty normal for someone who comes to Christ to see, oh, this isn't the way God designed to use my sexuality. They don't have to negate all the good things that they've experienced with the person that they've been in a relationship with to recognize that God says something else about sexuality they might end up making a very big cost. I mean, I've I've known some people who decide to stay in that relationship legally, but to live celibately, to break off having sex. That has happened with with some couples who both come to Christ. 
I've known some couples where one person came to Christ and decided that in order to honor the Lord, um, he needed to be celibate. And his partner decided, his husband decided to leave him. I mean, Paul talks about this reality in 1 Corinthians 7. Sometimes if a, if a spouse comes to know the Lord, the other spouse can't abide it and they leave. And then that person is, you know, that person is free. Um, those references that she just gave you, uh, I think that's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, but those references that she just gave you do not apply to gay marriages. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. Uh, but sometimes it will mean, yeah, sometimes it will mean getting a divorce. God hates divorce. He does. It breaks that image of marriage just as surely as anything else. So did you hear what she just said? That if you have a lesbian couple who gets saved, they shouldn't get divorced because God hates divorce. What planet is this woman from? Is this what happens when you go to a seminary? Is this what happens when you get a PhD or you get educated? If it is, I thank God that I never went to the seminary, that I don't have a degree. I don't want to be educated to such a, such a level that those words are coming out of my mouth. There is no such thing as gay marriage. It doesn't exist. That is something that was completely created in the 20th century. Now, have there been gay people throughout history? Absolutely. Uh, but has this stuff been sanctioned? Well, let me tell you. Journey with me for a moment. I want to take you back in time. The year is 2000 and. Hmm. I don't know. 2008. Uh, I want to take you back to the day that America elected our first gay president. New this morning, another magazine cover causing some controversy. This one is about President Obama after he announced his public support for same-sex marriage last week. Here's the picture on the cover of Newsweek this week. Eyewitness News reporter Nicole Estefan joins us live in the newsroom now with more on the controversy. Good morning. Newsweek's latest cover said to hit stands in about a week and no doubt it will spawn some conversation here. It declares Barack Obama as, quote, the first gay president. Obama's face is pictured looking skyward, complete with a rainbow halo. The accompanying article analyzes the president's backing of gay marriage. Now, Obama said Wednesday he supports gay marriage, reversing his position on a controversial social issue just six months before the November election. The president says after years of conversation, he now believes that gays and lesbians have the right to marry. Meanwhile, the presumptive Republican presidential nominee, Mitt Romney, reiterated this weekend that he believes marriage is between a man and a woman. At least one area politician is weighing in on the issue. People get that this is about human dignity. And I applaud the president for standing up for human dignity. That is an American value. Newsweek's latest issue will be on the stands May 20. All right. So if you go back to the year 2008 when Barack Obama was elected, and uh, here's a fun fact for you. Um, that was the same year that God put on my heart to start Now the End Begins. It wouldn't launch until 2009. Um, but when Barack Obama became president, and don't give me any jazz about I don't I didn't like him. I didn't vote for him because he was black. Um, my son-in-law is black. Um, my my granddaughter, who is scheduled to be born sometime in mid July, is going to be 50 percent black. Uh, don't give me any jazz about feelings about black people. Um, I was 100 percent against the Obama agenda, whatever color he was now. Newsweek put him on the cover and said that Barack Obama was America's first gay president. Now, I want to string a couple of semi-conspiracy conspiracy things together for you, but I think it will make sense. Remember, we started this podcast talking about tuck-friendly bathing suits at Target and the days of Lot from Luke chapter 17. Obama, 2008, the first gay president, two years before he became president, 
This is what the man who would become his vice president had to say about marriage. The president used his radio address uh, yesterday and tomorrow in the Rose Garden to talk about a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage. You know, think about this. The world's going to Hades in a handbasket. We are desperately concerned about the circumstance relating to uh, avian flu. We don't have enough vaccines. We don't have enough police officers. And we're going to debate the next three weeks, I'm told, gay marriage, a flag amendment, and God only knows what else. I can't believe the American people can't see through this. We already have a law. The Defense of Marriage Act, where we've all voted, not where I voted and others said, look, marriage is between a man and a woman, and states must respect that. Nobody's violated that law. There's been no challenge to that law. Why do we need a constitutional amendment? Marriage is between a man and a woman. So there you have current pretend president Joe Biden telling you in 2006, two years before he would become Barack Obama's vice president, telling you that marriage is between a man and a woman. But then in 2008, everything changed and things started to change dramatically and drastically. Uh, Take a listen to Obama talking about creating an environment of dignity and kindness for transgender children. A strong believer in equal rights for everyone. Yeah. A very strong believer in that. I was wondering, though, with all the pressing, pressing issues that you have before you right now, right. why is the issue of which bathroom a person uses such an issue? Well, I, you know what? It's, it's a great question. Uh, somehow people think I made it an issue. I didn't make it an issue. There, there are a lot of things that are more pressing. You're absolutely right. Uh, what happened and what continues to happen is you have transgender kids in schools and they get bullied and they get ostracized and it's tough for them and you know uh, we're of a generation where that stuff was all out of sight and out of mind and so people suffered silently but now they're out in the open And the question then is, schools are asking us, the Department of Education, for guidance. How should we deal with this? And my answer is that we should deal with this issue the same way we'd want it dealt with if it was our child. And that is to try to create an environment of some dignity and kindness So there you have Obama saying that if it was your child who was becoming a transgender, you know, what type of environment would you like to have for that child? Whatever happened to parents who keep their children thinking and doing the right thing as what parents are supposed to do? If your child had somehow gotten a hold of a package of cigarettes and was attempting to smoke them and started coughing up a fit, would you take that little Johnny or little Susie off to the side and say, hey, you're doing it all wrong. Let me show you how to hold the cigarette. And don't use matches. It's so much easier with a lighter. And when you take your first... No, you wouldn't do anything like that. You would turn to little Johnny and little Susie. You would take the cigarettes away. You would give them a little bit of uh, um, an application to the seat of correction. uh, And um, you would tell them why what they were doing was not the right thing. But you see, that's not the agenda that Barack Obama and Joe Biden came into office with. They came into office with an agenda. Now, In terms of the end times, where does transgenderism play? Well, that's under the heading of the days of Lot. And Jesus says that the that the seven year time of Jacob's trouble is going to be like the days of Noah. And uh, we have posters hanging here in the studio 
One is about the days of Lot, um, and one is about the days of Noah. And during this time period, the fallen angels come back, the giants come back, and Sodom and Gomorrah, spiritually speaking, they come back. And in retrospect, it becomes obvious that that's what God used Barack Obama to do. Now, you might say to yourself, well, why am I talking about Barack Obama? He hasn't been president since 2016. That's true. But his third term is two and a half years completed. Joe Biden is his third term. You remember what Joan Rivers said right before she died mysteriously in a routine operation? This is what Joan Rivers said about Barack and Michelle Obama. Ms. Rivers, how are you? You made you made a ton of news officiating the wedding in New York yesterday. Is this like a is this like a new uh, cottage uh, career move I for you? I'm so excited. Okay. And I should do very well because I don't show. And do you think that the country will see the first the United States will see the first gay president or the first woman well, we president? We already have it with Obama. So let's just calm down. Got it. You know Michelle is a trans. Uh, I'm sorry. She's a what? A transgender. We all know. Oh my gosh. Oh gosh. It's okay. So there you have Joan Rivers mere months before her suspicious death on the operating table. Um, she wasn't if you watch that video, she wasn't laughing. She wasn't joking. She she wasn't even smiling when she said Barack Obama is America's first gay president. Well, isn't that what Newsweek said when they put him on the cover? And that Michelle Obama is a transgender. Now, do I think Michelle Obama is really Michael Robinson? I don't know. I, I think that the pictures are amusing. Somebody's good at Photoshop. I don't really have an opinion on that. I've never examined Michelle Obama. I've never seen evidence proving that she's a transgender um, all I know is that Joan Rivers said shortly before her death that Obama was gay and Michelle was a transgender man. I mean, that's, I mean, that's that. But here we have Joe Biden, who's halfway through, a little bit more than halfway through Barack Obama's third term. And listen to what he said when he was campaigning, one of the rare moments he came out of his basement um, before he got those 81 million votes. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, This is what he said about transgender children. Remember, this is the same guy who said marriage was between a man and a woman. I'm, I'm the proud mom of two girls, eight and ten. My youngest daughter is transgender. The Trump administration has attacked the rights of transgender people, banning them from military service, um, weakening non-discrimination protections, and even removing the word transgender from some government websites. How will you, as president, reverse this dangerous and discriminatory agenda and ensure that the lives and rights of LGBTQ people are protected under U.S. law. And again, the question is not about the rights of LGBTQ people. The specific question is, what about transgender minor children? This is what Joe Biden said. I will flat out just change the law. Every, eliminate those executive orders, number one. You may recall, I'm the guy who said, uh, I was raised by a man who, uh, I remember I was being dropped off. My, my, my dad was a high school educated, well-read man who uh, was a really decent guy. And I was being dropped off to get, get an application in them. Joe Biden said on his first day in office, he would just flat out change the law. Now, to his credit, the very first executive order that he signed, he kept his promise. He changed the law regarding transgender children. 
Daniel 2.21 says, And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings, and he setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. Do you see where we are? I hope that I've been able to paint a successful picture for you that you're living in the warm-up to the days of Lot. This is not something that's coming. This is something that has arrived. A number of years ago, and let me see if I can quickly pull up this article. A number of years ago, I wrote this article and I took a lot of heat for it. And people said that I was crazy and I was just being sensational. Um, And this is an article that we wrote. Let me see what the year was. Um, The title of the article is Under the Banner of the Rainbow Battle Flag, God is Judging a Godless America by allowing the LGBTQ plus P for pedophile army. And that's coming. You can bet the farm on that. Uh, Minor attracted persons, uh, whatever you call it, that's coming. I guarantee it. You can write it down. You can mark it down. You can quote me on it. And I promise you that that is going to age very well, but in a bad way. Um, But we did this article called under the banner of the rainbow battle flag god is judging a godless america donald trump says that we got to make america great again it is impossible i want you to imagine that you own your own home or you rent a home and one day the sewer starts backing up and it backs up so badly that it's kind of coming up through the kitchen pipes And a little half inch of sewer water is in your kitchen sink. It's in your bathroom sink. It's in your bathroom toilets. And when you come home from work that day, you open the door and immediately, like you're hitting the face with the heel of somebody's hand, you smell that sewer coming up. Do you take the Febreze? (laughs) And do you spray that? What do you do? Do you put something over your nose so you can't smell? No. You get on the phone and you call the plumber. You call whoever maintains sewers. And you say, you got to come over and and you got to fix my sewer problem. And if it's a really bad problem, they're going to have to rip up the ground and put a new septic system in. That is the only way to take care of that problem. So you want to make America great again, but you want to allow transgender children and tuck friendly bathing suits and, 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 and biological men in the same bathrooms and restrooms and changing rooms as actual women. You want to allow that, but on the surface, and this is not, I'm not, this is not an anti-Trump thing that I'm saying. I'm just simply saying. You can't put a cover on a pile of dung and have it be anything other than a pile of dung with a nice cover on top of it. And that's what this whole make America great again. Can you make America great again? Yeah. You got to get rid of every law for LGBTQIA. There are already enough laws on the books that if a human being is verbally assaulted. That's a crime. If a human being is attacked physically, that's a crime. If a human being is killed, that's all these things are crimes. We don't need separate anti-discrimination laws for these imaginary categories that we've created. And we've allowed and we have created an environment that is encouraging children, children. I used to be a school teacher. I taught music from K through 12. I know a little bit about children. I'm a father of three kids. I was raised with four brothers. 
I understand siblings. I understand children just a little bit. And if you expose them to all this stuff, well, they're going to want to try it. Some of them anyway. This is what Adolf Hitler did with the Hitler Youth. People think that he just showed up in 1933 and all out of nowhere. Well, the truth of the matter is he joined the National Socialist German Workers Party, the uh, NSDAP, in 1920. He created the Hitler Youth in 1921. So by the time that Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in 1933, he had already had almost a decade and a half to raise an entire generation of Germans to his ideology. You know what's happening right now? What's happening right now is an entire generation of children are being raised in the transgender ideology. And if the Lord tarries, you're going to see a days of lot like you're going to think you're living inside a horror movie. You're going to think that you're living inside a chick track. That's how bad it's going to get if the Lord tarries. So you better buckle up and you better get ready because that we are on a collision course with that. We are on a collision course with this. I think children are only unsafe at drag shows when a shooter shows up to kill them. That's right. That's where the threat is. I would challenge anyone just to get to know trans people. We are a vibrant, diverse community, as diverse as anyone else. You know, I'm from the great state of Texas. I served in the military. I go to church every Sunday. My faith is very important to me. But God made me in her image. God made me transgender. And to see these people so cynically weaponize this and exploit these children's debts and their teachers' debts, it breaks my heart. I wonder what those families are thinking right now. What do you, what do you mean, feel when you have somebody like Michael Knowles say at CPAC, we need to eradicate transgenderism, and when somebody like Tucker Carlson says that transgender people are at war with Christians? I can't see Christ in their words. That's for damn sure. I can't see where the biblical principles of loving your neighbor and walking the walk with Christ that they can see. I, I can't see what they're seeing right now because that's not of Christ. It's not. Yeah. So there you have an ex-military transgender veteran telling you that God made him in her image. There's no female part of God. So you got to prepare for that and you have to prepare for this. Drag is holy. There has been an assault on the rights of drag performers in this country, and we must call out the hypocrisy and the injustice. Jesus called himself a mother hen longing to gather up her chicks. Gender is a construct, you see. And if Jesus can be a mother hen, then you can dress in drag. I've even heard it said that Jesus was, and humanity is, God in drag. So let me say this again for those of you in the back. Drag is holy. And let me say this for you in the front. Drag is an abomination. Drag is unnatural. Drag is reprobate. I'm not talking about Jack Lemon and Tony Curtis dressing up as women in a comedy. I'm not talking about the, oh, what's the name of that thing? The, the Harvard Hasty Pudding Club where they have these famous people be their honorary speakers and they dress up in drag. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the type of drag that people dress up because they want to live their life as a gender that they are not. Now, we only have about 10 minutes left, and I would never, 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 ever leave you on this note. <clears throat> I believe that God put this podcast on my heart today, and maybe unlike a lot of other podcasters, I don't have any notes that I'm reading from. I didn't write it down. I didn't spend a lot of time putting this show together, but where I put my time is in Bible study. It's kind of like if you work at a bank 
I have lots of friends who at one time or another worked at a bank. They don't train you on the dozens of different types of counterfeit bills. They train you on what the real thing looks like so that when you come across any type of counterfeit, you can spot it right away. And if you want to, your best defense in the end times against deception, the very first thing when Peter, James, and John come before Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 3, and they say, Lord, what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And the very first thing that Jesus says is, take heed that no man deceive you. And the very first sign of the end times is deception. Now, maybe you don't have all the time that I, that I have to do this type of research and read all these articles and <clears throat> watch all these videos and gather all these audio clips. Maybe you don't have time to do all that, and maybe you don't. But if you would take the time that you do have, and if you would really, really get back into the Word. Now, we are blessed here, the vast majority of the people who listen to these broadcasts on a weekly basis, the vast majority of you are on fire for the Lord. You're trying to get something done. That's why you're here. And I thank God for that. But there is still that 8%, 9%, 10% of people who listen. They might not even be saved. And if they are saved, they might not yet be on fire for God. And that's why we always pray, God For those who are listening, who don't know you as Savior, we pray that something would be said and done to lead a lost soul to you. And yesterday I announced the start of our um, upcoming gospel witness billboard campaign called Are You Saved? And um, I'm so excited about that. And the, the verse that we're using is Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And for those of us that are saved, we pray, God, let something be said and done that would get a a, a lukewarm Laodicean on fire for you. So I want to play one more clip today. And I just want you to, whatever you're doing, I want you to lean back in your chair I want you to close your eyes and I want you to listen to this clip and then I'll have about two minutes left and I'm going to talk about this clip and I'm going to apply it to today's podcast. Take a listen to this. As soon as peace occurs, I want um, I want that cloth distributed to the workers. Two and a half meters each. Also, each person is to get a bottle of vodka. They won't drink it. They know its value. Likewise, those Egyptian cigarettes we organize. It'll be done. Everything you ask. We have written a letter trying to explain things in case you were captured. Every worker has signed it.
Hebrew from the Talmud. It says, whoever saves one life, saves the world entire. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Yeah, Paul, you're going to get a crown. You did some great things for God. He used you to write 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. Paul says, You want a crown? And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Every time I hear that clip from Schindler's List, it reduces me to a puddle of tears. One reason is because God 
broke my heart for the Jewish people back in eighth grade. And um, my dad served in World War II. I grew up with that World War II mentality. I was surrounded by World War II neighbors and Holocaust victims with tattoos. I have a great love and compassion for the Jewish people and for the nation of Israel. Absolutely. But the main reason why that clip reduces me to a puddle of tears is because when Oscar Schindler, if you watch that movie and, and they're presenting him with, that, with the gold of that present, I, I think it was a ring of some kind. And by this point, Oscar Schindler, who starts out only thinking about himself, he starts out only trying to use the Jewish people to make money. But when you get to the end of it, he is saturated in the car. I could have got 10 people for that car, this gold ring. I could have got another one soul, two soul, three souls. When you as a Bible-believing Christian get to the point when you look at people not as targets, but you look at them as eternal souls that are going to exist for eternity, either in heaven or hell, and you get that Oscar Schindler mentality that God has put in your hand the gold for you to be a witness of Jesus Christ and to not to argue, not to debate necessarily, not to attack the transgenders or the lesbians or anything like that, but to stand for the truth lovingly and firmly and compassionately. I always say, preach to somebody the way that you would have wanted somebody to preach to you when you were lost. Jude says it the best. Jude 122. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. It is time for Christians to get the, that the Oscar Schindler mentality towards lost people. And when you do that, when you look at people as souls, God will give you fruit for your labors. I thank you so much for tuning in today for this Prophecy News Podcast. Please pray for our camp meeting weekend and, and, and all the, the, the things that are going on here. And pray that God would give all of us fruit for our labors, everybody who attends, everybody who's staying back at home and praying for this weekend. Um, <clears throat> we are really starting to have a very visible impact on the community. And our bookstore gets filled up with each passing day more and more with people who are hearing about what's going on there and they're stopping in just because they're curious. Uh, pray that God gives us souls for our labors and um, uh, we will definitely, I will keep everybody updated with um, the things that are going on this weekend. But the next thing that's happening, 6 p.m., a live broadcast a live stream of the soul trap coming from the bookstore and you can go to now the end begins to watch that or you can go to the soul trap youtube channel at 6 p.m eastern standard time and watch that <clears throat> thank you everybody for being part of the nteb global family across america and around the world keep us in your prayers this weekend and lord willing um as far as a broadcast goes well, we'll see you for the live stream tonight at 6 o'clock and uh, various live streams tomorrow. And the next broadcast, Lord willing, will be Monday at noon for the podcast. Have a great weekend, everybody. The singers are tired The church as we know it Is losing its fire And some are discouraged From bearing the load But we must determine To keep pressing on Cause it's just one more soul Were to walk down the aisle Every struggle, it would be worth every mile. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all in 
singers go sing and laymen keep sharing that Jesus is King. The angels have gathered, they're surrounding the throne, and they'll start rejoicing for just one more soul. Cause it's just one more soul. 